Hello and welcome to season two of the Coach Emmanuel podcast, hosted by me, Danny Mills. Today I'm joined by Nigel Quashy, who made nearly 100 appearances in the Premier League, playing for clubs including QPR, Portsmouth and Southampton. He also played 14 times for Scotland, which included a defeat to Marcello Lippi's Italy side in the San Siro the year they went on to win the World Cup in 2006. Nigel is now the founder of IP Development Academy in Birmingham. In this episode, we'll be talking about Nigel's career at the top level, what made his debut so unique and so special, and some of the great coaches and managers he's played under, and now his transition into coaching. So Nigel, thanks for joining us uh, on the Coach Emmanuel podcast. Let's go back to the very, very beginning. What got you into football and, and where did you start playing? Well, it was quite funny, really, because I didn't like football until I was about 12 years of age. 11 and a half going 12, had no interest in it. And then all of a sudden, I started playing at school. And then it, it sort of materialised from there that I um, made it into a grassroots side into uh, in the Surrey Keys area right next to Mirwall. And I was uh, just started playing. And then all of a sudden, I, I went into secondary school. And then started playing then played for the school. And that's how it all sort of kicked into play, really. So you were quite a late developer in terms of the modern day football when they're looking at, you know, kids at age six, seven, eight years old, taking them into academies. Yeah, it was, um, it was strange, really, because when I look at it now, then kids are starting at six. And I wasn't aware of all of that at that age. And I just thought it was uh, something that I... I got a grip of when I started playing for school and I thought, oh, I like this. And then it just materialised from there. And then who took you first into that professional setup? You know, how, how did that step come about? Yeah, it was it was strange, really, because I was playing for the school and I went to school in Peckham, played, for, played in the school game. And then a QPR scout had uh, been watching the school game and asked me if I'd like to come into QPR. And I, he gave me a bit of information about, you know, them training in a... Uh, in, uh, they called it a um, centre of excellence, which was in South London, right next to Charlton Football Club on the other side of their fence on the Sandy Astro turf pitch. And I didn't, couldn't figure it out because I thought QPR was in West London when I did a bit of homework and research. But then they had centres and then they explained to me that they had centres all around North, South, East and West of London. And that was the closest facility to me back then. So I went into there and uh, it... it you know, I enjoyed it and I was only training once a week there, which was a Tuesday night. And then it just, you know, it started to sort of really progress regarding the, the training and up in the training after a, uh, the two years. And then it just really sort of got a little bit more serious. So, I mean, it's jump a couple of years on. So your rise really from being spotted at, you know, 12, 13 years old, not even even interested in football till 12, 13 years yep. old, suddenly to make your debut at 17 in, in the yeah. first team is quite sensational. And I think even more interesting is how that debut came about and, and who was against. Tell, tell us about that. Yeah, I was, I was a YTS at the time and um, I, I, I was, I was, you know, I'd gone in full time and I was cleaning the kits like the old YTS game and uh, cleaning the kits, boots. And all of a sudden I was, uh, travelling up to Manchester where you had to sort of rotate on who was doing an away game. I, I remember I, got, I remember doing those games of, of, of standing on the bus for three hours, making tea, <laughs> cleaning up afterwards, <laughs> ser serving pizzas to the lads. and, and Basically, you were, you were a gopher, weren't you, um, in yeah, those de days? Definitely. I'd done all that going all the way up there to Manchester. And uh, I'd gone to the stadium to put out all the kits and all the boots with the, with the kit man and uh, all the physio in the treatment room, got back to the uh, hotel and just took it as normal as to prepare for the game. Uh, I had gone early with the, the physio and the, uh, the kit man and everything to the stadium to make sure everything was all in place. All the players had turned up. Uh, Ray Wilkins and all the staff had, had all turned up. The players got off the bus an hour and a half before kickoff. And... Uh, he called the team meeting and I was still putting stuff out on the sides and everything like that. And then he named the team and I was in it. And I, and I was like, yeah, what, what you talk? Like I couldn't figure it out. And then he just said, yeah, you, you, you're starting. And I was like, huh? And then I, I just, he just said, just go out, just play like you're playing at 
over the park and I thought, yeah, play at the park at Man United. Yeah, that's uh, no, no problems at all. So just cracked on with it, played. Then I wanted to call my mum at home and wanted to borrow his mobile phone. And he, um, he had basically said, call this number. And I called the number and uh, my mum picked up and I just told her that I'd made my debut. And uh, she said she was outside, she knows. And I was, I was like, eh? how does that make sense? Because we didn't have a mobile phone. And then when we got outside, uh, she had basically told me that um, Ray Wilkins had bought, bought her a, a sort of a, a mobile phone, and uh, which was our, one of our first mobile phones, and that he had called her to give all the indications and all the information of what was going on, and the train ticket had been paid and everything like that. And she was outside waiting for me. So, it, it, you know, without him, uh, none of this would have been possible. So I was, I'm really, really grateful for him as well. Well, obviously, sadly, we've we've lost Ray now. But, I mean, that just goes to show how incredibly, one, special he was, thoughtful as a man. But what incredible sort of man management skills, you know, even yeah. back then, you know. Clearly, he knew you were going to play, but maybe didn't want to make you feel too nervous or give you too much build-up to that. He knew how important your family was to you and, and had arranged all that sort of behind your back, if you like. But, yeah. I mean just incredible sort of man management you know in this day and age where you know it's all seems so spiteful at times oh you know obviously the way that he had uh, looked after me um was something that i'll never forget and he put me and my family you know put put us first and really looked after us in the fact that I've made my debut, but for my mum to turn up at a football match and then pay for a ticket and have a mobile phone and pay for a mobile phone for us to have contact was something that I, I, I can't forget. But his man, man management skills from then onwards, it was always about me. It was never about the team, me playing in the team. He always put the players first. He, he, he spoke to us all individually. He treated us right. He, he was just an absolute gentleman and he he could put football aside to make sure that you was all right and what was going on in your life. Is there anything that he can do to try and get the best out of you off the field? And, you know, a phone call, pick the phone up and just say, listen, how are you doing? Everything all right at home? Are you okay? Do you need anything? And and that was on a regular basis. So, you know, with, without people like that, I wouldn't be in the position that I am now. How nervous do you think you would have been if he'd have told you? I'm assuming the debut was on a Saturday because all football yeah. back then was on a Saturday. There was none of this sort of, you know, Monday, Tuesday night, Sunday afternoon, whatever it is. How nervous would you have been if he'd have told you maybe on the Wednesday and thinking, I'm going to make me debut, Old Trafford, I don't know, whatever it was back then, 60,000 people in the stadium. Again, Schmeichel, Neville, Butt, Giggs, Beckham, Keane. So do you think he definitely did the right thing by leaving it till the last minute? One hundred percent. I think it gives you. It doesn't give you enough thinking time. It doesn't. It doesn't give you. You know the way that he put it was. I couldn't figure it out, and I didn't understand it why why he did it that way. But then now, as I've sort of gone along now into sort of coming through and basically going into different managers, meeting different managers, the way that they treat players, the way that he treated players, it all starts to add up all the all the way through your career. And then you really get to understand why certain people do certain things as managers. But for him to do it the way that he did, I think it was possibly the best way. And I think if I had the opportunity, I've sort of based a lot around him, I'll probably do it the same way. It's interesting because a lot of the people that we spoke to here on, on the, the Coach Emmanuel podcast, you know, everyone has always said, actually, just go out and enjoy it. Just go and have fun. You know? And clearly that's what he did. The biggest moment of your career one of the probably the biggest games in your life ever, the biggest days in your life ever. And it was just dropped on you like that. And he said, you know what? Just go out and just enjoy yourself. And that naivety of a young player is brilliant, you know, on, on most occasions. And we see it now with the likes of what Gareth has done with the England team and with Rashford and young players. And he said, you know what? Just go and enjoy yourselves. And, and that's got to be the most important thing about football, about coaching. He... Um... You know, the, one of the first things that he said to me on the Monday morning after the game was, he said, you're, you, you're just a kid. You don't worry about results. You don't worry about what fans say or what people think. Just go and play football. 
you know, the first thing I'll always remember is he, he, the first thing he said to me was, was football never chose you. You chose football. So respect it and give everything that you've got because it's the best game in the world. But you've got to play with fun. You've got to go and enjoy it and don't have any fear or worry about anything that goes on out there. I'm your manager. I take care of that. I've got to look after you. I've got to treat you right. And I just believe that that's the way that I am now. And he's really had an effect on my life and my career and really give me a path into what I'm doing now. So I'll say it again, without him, none of this is, is possible and where I'm at today, especially with the supporters because they're the football club. They're the ones that make the football club. And he he always emphasised that and made clear that remember that there's people out there that work hard for their money. All you need to do is give everything that you got and show them that you want to play football, but you've got to enjoy it. So it, that, that's the way it is. Clearly, from what you've just said, mentally and psychologically had a huge influence, uh, not just on your career, but possibly on your, your life as well. But what about as a player? I mean, how good was he as a manager? What did you learn from him? How good was he still on the training pitch in those days? Well, put it this way, he was probably one of the hardest players to get close to. Uh, you know, even when he was he was an older player, he was a player manager at the time, and he used to come into training. And uh, he used to train like it was his last training session. No matter what it was, he, he he would move that ball so quickly that you couldn't get close to him. And it, he would, five or five go on, and he'd call you over or stop you in that five or five while the game's going on. And he'd ask you to show him certain things on a football pitch. You won't worry about what the, what the game was going on or how competitive it was. He'll stop it. You as that individual, and the game's going on around you, and you want to move to go and get the ball, and he's talking to you, and you're just like, he's trying to teach you things in the middle of a game. And it was all those sort of things and watching him as a player and his career, you know, Glasgow Rangers, AC Milan, Man United, all the top, top clubs. And th- th- there wasn't anybody better for me to learn off at that time. So obviously you had a, an incredible grounding um, at QPR. Fantastic. You then moved on briefly to, to Nottingham Forest uh, before you yep. signed for, for Portsmouth. And yep. let's just say it was quite an unstable first season with I think, yep. three, three different managers until Harry Redknapp came in. Yeah, well, at Nottingham Forest, it was a difficult time for me because QPR was basically was going. They got relegated and they were in a difficult financial situation. And the chairman had said to me that I'd probably need to be sold to to to, to balance out the book. So I said, listen, anything for the club because what it's done for me. And I know that people will be disappointed, but there's always a time and a place for people to really understand it. So I'd gone to Nottingham Forest and it it didn't really work out for me. And and. I'm going to give a full indication of that and the reasons why at that time and with my partner at that time, I'd lost my son at 20, 20 years of age. And I was in a, I never had anybody else around me to, to guide me. I, I didn't have that influence like I did at QPR. And I was sort of looked at as a main player and that I could sort of deal with certain things. And I lost my son and I was, I was in a bad place at that time. And, and I think then, that's that's difficult for people in the outside world to appreciate. Going going back to those days when there wasn't really probably social media, well, there wasn't social media. It probably wasn't in the press. People just assume that you've turned up, you know, the, the, a good, you know, high-profile player just expects you to turn up and be brilliant every single week. They've got no idea what is actually going on in your personal life. The fact that you've had to move, you know, 200 miles north you know, of, of the country, all those types of things, personal issues, your family, losing your son, all those types of things. No one's got a clue about that, but you get judged, you still get judged almost inappropriately at times. And, and I think that makes it even harder. 100%. And, I, and the fans didn't know because it was kept really quiet and I didn't want to put my family in that situation at the time. And the main thing, I, I was, I didn't want to really play. And, performances I wasn't playing very well and that was the reason why but I still tried to sort of balance it out a little bit because I, I wanted to occupy myself but I got back into training and David Platt was great with me but I still struggled so what happened then was I had uh, I said to him that I probably might need a change I might need something to get me closer back to London to family to really sort of get a grip of it but then I got a phone call from Tony Pulis and totally, the first thing Tony Pulis has said to me is, how am I? Um, everything OK? And he'd, he'd been made aware of the situation. And uh, he said, I've got somebody for you to meet. 
And I was thinking, why is this guy calling me up and saying, am I okay? I've got somebody for you to meet. So he, he said, listen, don't worry about football. I want you to jump on a train and I want you to come down to uh, Portsmouth and I want you to get to this hotel, the Solent Hotel. I'll never forget it. And he said, I've got somebody for you to meet. So I thought, okay, I'll do that because he's take the time and effort to, to, to call me. So I've gone down to Portsmouth, got into the hotel. He's, he's there with a gentleman. He said, listen, I'm not interested in football. I'm more interested in you as a person and what you've been through. So I was like, God, this guy's unbelievable. He said, I've got a sports psychologist for you. I know you've been through a lot. Here's somebody that wants to help you. Started talking to this guy and I'd, I'd, I'd sort of built up a relationship with this guy where we were, I was going, I went back to Nottingham and I was still doing a bit of training and talking to this guy over the phone. And basically, Tony Pulis has said, listen, we're going to do a transfer for you to come to Portsmouth. Don't worry about playing. We're going to get you right, and then we're going to get you back playing. And then I built up the relationship with him and the sports psychologist. And after a period of time, he got me back into football. So without him, I don't think I'd be playing football again. So there's two important people at that time that have really taken their time to really get me right as an individual, not as a footballer. I mean, and that's an incredible story, really. And, and also, you know, those those two people that, that helped you out, that got you back into it, that probably don't get any praise for that, you know, plaudits. Or, again, they get judged on what they do, you know, especially Tony Pierce, in their professional life, you know, what they do, how they cut, all those types of things. People don't often see what really happens behind the scenes. And it's, I, d- I don't think it gets highlighted enough in this day and age, that actually the amount of good work that a lot of football people do behind the scenes? No. It's surprising because these are two people that, you know, you you look at and and people just think that footballers have, you know, they turn up and train in the mornings and, you know, everything's all right, you can go off in the afternoons and do whatever you want. But the man management side of it is so important. You're listening to the Coaching Manual podcast, hosted by me, Danny Mills. So obviously later that year, obviously you went through, again, not just personally, but in terms of football-wise, quite a traumatic time at at Portsmouth, going through a lot of issues at the time. Obviously Harry Redknapp came in. What was it, we all know about what Harry's like on the surface, but what's he really like to, to work under? Well... The first thing that he puts puts forward to you is what he what he expects of of you as uh, individuals and as a team. It was all about the team. But his man management skills towards me was another person that I got at the right time. And obviously, with the issues that went on at Portsmouth, he came in and made it clear to everybody that he was going to get promoted that year. And he said, "You're either with me or you're not." And uh, I was I was quite fortunate enough to be one of those players that he wanted to keep. And he, his man management skills towards me was 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 unbelievable, and I was, you know, really a sort of a mainstay in the, in in the squad, and really, really enjoyed playing underneath him. Of course, you, you got promotion uh, to the Premier League in o two o three. I mean, how good was that season? Um, it was unreal, because in a short space of time, he he gave us that belief to just go and play all right, I'll set you up as a team, but you're professional footballers. You should understand the game at this age. These are certain things that I want from you, but you've got to go and play. Same as going back to when I made my debut. Go and have fun. Go and play. Show people that you're enjoying it, but the willingness to work hard and, and, and make sure that, you know, you, you, you give everything to the group. So that, that he wasn't over the top with anything. His team talks were very short. And he was, we were given the belief to uh, just go and play, really. Of course, in, the, in that season, oh, he got a promotion. Uh, the next season, 3 4 incredibly well, finished 13th. Great season in the Premier League, unbeaten against Arsenal's Invincibles um, at that stage. But you played with some great players at Portsmouth at that time. I mean, Yakubu up front. I mean, how good was he and, and how, what made him special? Because a lot of times you watched him and just thought, this guy never runs. It doesn't. It doesn't go anywhere. <laughs> the, 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 well, they they formed a a nice chant for him, which was just feed him, feed the yak, and he'll score. And 
he was deadly in training when he first come to, to come to the club. It was touch goal, touch goal, and he, any any sign of those, you know, the goals. He he, he was just. He was deadly, and at that time, it formed a great partnership with Todorov, and they both had that combination that that they could really, really take chances quickly without really having to think about it, and really put put that you know that finishing touch to moves that really. And that's so important sometimes, isn't it? Though, just having it's not always about just having the best players. It's about having the right players that fit together, and I I often say that about the, the Leeds team that I played in. Everybody in that team, it was a jigsaw puzzle. Everybody just fitted together and it worked pretty much, pretty good most of the time. But the moment you started taking one or two pieces out, it didn't quite work. And we weren't all, we weren't all the best players in the world. You know, we weren't always the most gifted, but we, we just worked together. And that's one of the key things as a manager nowadays, isn't it? It's making sure that it's about the team and the team works, not just going out and buying all the best players. That's right. I was, you know, I was been, I've been told, but I was told by Harry Redknapp, it's uh, team first, individual second, and the players that put the work in were always the ones that made the team sort of function better for the flair players and the more talented, the gifted players to go and express themselves in certain areas of the pitch, and that's where sometimes it goes a lot unnoticed. But like you said, you know, you've, you've got players that can fit together, you've got players that are like a jigsaw, but you do take those pieces out and sometimes it just doesn't function right. And, you know, that's what happened towards, you know, as, as teams do go along, you know, there is one or two players that do get sold and, and sometimes it just dismantles the group a little bit and you've got to try and find a way to get that back. So it, 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 you're 100% right there. So then I suppose you made quite a controversial move to go from... <laughs> Portsmouth to Southampton, uh, yeah. along with Harry. I mean, just describe that. The rivalry between the two is absolutely enormous. And you must have, I suppose, you were obviously living in the area. Yes. We, we, that must have been quite difficult at times. Well, I've been offered a three-year contract to extend it. And then all of a sudden, Harry left and they took it away. And and, and I, I was, I couldn't believe it because I was happy to sign the contract. And then they said to me, no, you're, uh, we're going to, you know, we want to sell you. And they wanted to sell me to Southampton. And I was playing for Scotland at the time. So Glasgow Rangers showed an interest in possibly going on loan for the remainder of the season. That's a, that's a, lo- that's a long way from Portsmouth. It's definitely a long <laughs> way from Portsmouth. But it was a way, it was it was a long way that I thought that I could get away from the controversy of, of moving down the road. They had said to me that I won't be going to Glasgow Rangers, that they would want the money for me to go to Southampton. And I would said, well, you know, I'm putting myself at risk in, in having the supporters that I've played for for such a long time and then going down the road and maybe not being accepted. I was basically at a game. The manager at the time, Zayed, said, we're not going to play you. I said, I wanted to play. He said, no, we're not playing. All of a sudden, I'm sitting in the stand and basically I'll get everybody doing chants and calling me names. And I would basically got, I felt that I would got hung out to dry, that, that they had... Uh, put me in a position where I was no longer to, to stay at the club and then I, I went to Southampton and to, what, to be fair Southampton the supporters were fantastic towards me they they really took me in but then I still had the off the field problems in pulling up in a petrol station and then people threatening to pour petrol over my car and set me on fire so it was it was it was it was horrible living in between the two and then I had to move closer towards London and sort of travel up down the M27 to get to Southampton's training ground as well. So, it and wasn't, again, it, it, nice. it goes to show how how difficult sometimes things off the field can be. The the issues that you have to deal with. Everyone just sees the ninety minutes of a football match and thinks, oh, that's easy. Anyone can play. We all have to play football. It's just kicking the ball about. People don't often see those hardships, and also that must have been difficult for for family and stuff at times as well. It was. It was. It wasn't nice, and I had security drive, uh, driving me, and I was I was on edge all the time. And then all of a sudden, it sort of it died down a bit because at Southampton, I, I was playing well, and I really played well. And then I was captain, so I was vice captain at Portsmouth. Then I'd gone to Southampton, and then I was captain there, and I was really enjoying it. And I felt that. I wasn't wanted, but I went somewhere and then I was wanted. And then I played well, then a new manager come in. And if a new manager comes in, he doesn't fancy you. 
there's nothing you can do about it and you've got to respect it. And like I say, it's all about the football club. It was never about me. It's about the football club. It's about what's best for the team. And then they sold me to West Bromwich Albion and, uh, you know, I, I didn't want to leave, but the manager had come in at the time and wanted his own players. And, and sometimes you, you just have to accept it and, and, and move on. That that time you had at Southampton, they're obviously now renowned for having a fantastic academy. I mean, was that in its was, was that starting to be developed when you were there, or, or did it come a little bit after? Yeah, we used to play them on a Thursday. In, uh, we used to do team shape on a Thursday to prepare for the weekend. And I tell you what, they might as well turned up on the Saturday because. <laughs> You had um, Theo Walker in there. You had Dexter Blackstock. You had Gareth Bell. You had um, Adam Lalana. So we used to we used to do a bit of team shape and that. And I tell you something, now, they were unbelievable players, and and they were play- and their youth structure was was fantastic. I used to love going to watch them play because the ability and the talent that they had and the work ethic was was phenomenal. And and they were they were really really talented players that have now gone on to really have fantastic careers and like I said at that age the way that they were playing they could have any one of them could have went in the team and then that's when Theo Walcott came in and 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 really took took the first team by the scruff of the neck you then went on to play as you said you then moved to West Brom West Ham Birmingham Wolves MK Dons um, and then you finished your career in Iceland not not yeah. the, not the supermarket. Uh, I hope not. Uh, wasn't <laughs> wasn't one of, wasn't a Tesco's or a Sainsbury's. But what what made you suddenly go to Iceland? Well, they asked me to play. Would I come over and play? And there've been a few players that have gone over there in the past. And the first thing I said to them is, "Listen, I might be. You know, I'm not really interested in coming all that way. I'm more interested in what's your youth system like." What's your, what, what's your structure of your youth system? And they, they said, no, we want I, th- I think my first question would have been, how cold is it? I'll be honest with you. In the winter, it is cold. But the summer, it, it, it's it's a beautiful place. It's 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 great for the kids. The summer football is great. And, and, you know, I'd recommend anybody to go there. If they've got an opportunity to go there to play football as well or go there for a break as a as a, um, a holiday, I'd go because it's, it's a beautiful country. But you said that so a lot of it was about you know their youth system and um, bringing players through, and obviously we've now seen that come to fruition in, in the last few years in in Euros and World Cups. Yeah, definitely. They're, they've got so many talented players there, but their you know their work ethic and their willingness to learn and their willingness to get better and really really develop. You know they've got a great system over there, and I was lucky to go over there, and they wanted my sort of you know input into it. And we come to an agreement and me looking at the youth system and they gave me the sort of the free reins of basically developing the players there. And I sort of gave them my ideas and what I wanted to do and how to do it. And, and it all fitted into place at the time. Just want to touch on your international career uh, briefly. And we had a quick chat before you came on. We play, I think we played together at some stage for England under 21s. Yeah. But you ended up playing for Scotland. Yeah. Um, How did that every, happen? You can't, you can't leave England. Everybody asked the question, and uh, what happened was at the time I'd, I'd come through the twenty ones, and and then I'd gone into, I played a game for the B team for England B at the time when they'd be uh, the B team, and you know it was going really, really well, and then all of a sudden they, I think they brought in this new rule where you could go, and if you hadn't played for the, the full national team, that you could then go on and. Uh, you know, pick another country if you wanted to play. And I got a phone call from Bertie Volts and I thought, Bertie Volts, that guy's won the World Cup and, you know, he's he's won major tournaments. And then he was a Scotland manager and he basically called me and said, listen, we've we've dug deep and found out, your, you know, your, your background and, you know, what am I interested in coming into training and having a look and see if I'd be interested in playing. And, and, it, and it worked because my grandfather is full-blown Scottish. My mum's surname's McFarlane. So... It all made sense, and I was given an opportunity by them, and I just thought it was the right time. And and you know, com- com- competition career, in the England side at that in the England squad was was huge, wasn't it? At, at that it point, it was fierce. It was fierce. You know, Lampard, Gerrard, Scholes. Um, you, you know, all of those players playing at the time. You, you, you know, it was it was something else, and 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 this gave me an opportunity, but this. The Scotland national team and the federation and the players were were, were fantastic towards me, and, and I can't thank them enough. Especially, you know, playing in front of those uh, in front of the Tartan army. 
and I assume I'm going to I guess here probably one of the biggest games that you played most memorable games although you lost was against Italy before they won the World Cup and just to name drop again I'm just going to name the side that you played against Buffon Bonera Chiellini Cannavaro, Cannavaro Materazzi Cameronese Gattuso Cassano Giladino Pirlo and Totti <laughs> whose shirt did you get? <laughs> It was. It was um, Come on, whose shirt? You must. You must have got a decent shirt out of that lot. Uh, yeah, I got a totty one out of it. Oh, that's incredible. I, I think it was a. To- I'm, sure, I'm sure it was because there was a big debate in the changing room about who was getting what. Was there? Was there was a, a, much... Please tell me there was a big fight afterwards. Yeah. The te- well, put this way, I sat down on the bench and uh, I was thinking to myself, I wouldn't like to chase them around every week. You know, I'd put some mileage in, and I was sitting there, and I was thinking that was a shift and a half. Didn't really see the ball. I was just, I thought it was better just to turn up with a pair of Asics and just go for a run because I tell you, they, they, it was non-stop. They were because they, they, they won the they, world, they won the World Cup later on that, right. that year, didn't they? In '06. I mean, yeah, they, they, they that was a uh, an unbelievable team, and um, you know, I, I still talk about it now and say that it was proven that they would go on and win, win the World Cup. But yeah, there's some there's some poor players on that team sheet. I can guarantee you that. So, what what do you think's happened to, to Scottish football? Because it's, it's been a, a terrible decline in the last 10, 15, 20 years. And, you know, look back when you used to play there and even before that, there was always great Scottish players and yeah. they'd always be competitive and, and they just seem to have, have lost that now. Yeah, it's, it's, it's quite hard because obviously, you know, I think, it's, I think a lot of players have, have sort of, when you had Glasgow Rangers and you got Celtic, and then obviously Rangers have gone down into the lower leagues. A lot of players were based from Celtic uh, Rangers and then Aberdeen. And is it too easy to say it's just about money and those clubs being out to attract some of the the best talent and inspirational talent? Yeah, you've taken the word straight out of my mouth there. And I was going to say that on the financial side of it in Scottish football, it's very very difficult. It's very very tough, and with the TV money as well, what's what benefits it a little bit more is Celtic have been playing in the Champions League and, and they've made and been able to generate more money, whereas Rangers have had to come back up the leagues with the, the financial difficulty that they've been in. Aberdeen haven't got that financial power to compete with Celtic and it basically sort of, I think it just takes away that little bit more of the, the, the youth side of things as well regarding players with the distances and the and the the level of, of of play, whereas a lot of players are trying to come down into uh, England and really build up their careers on that front. So you think? I mean, reading between the lines, a, a big part of the problem is not how successful English football has been, but maybe how successful the Premier League has been, and the the money it's generated for players that everyone wants to migrate south as as soon as possible. Definitely, the the, the Premier League's on another level. Uh, it's uh, it's really really generated money beyond belief the, the obviously the TVs the networks it's, and, and it's really really I think taking a foothold in what goes you know obviously north of the border with Scotland it overtakes that I think by by miles and, and that's where it is difficult for players and players do want to come down here and, and showcase their abilities and compete at the highest level You're not very old but obviously you've retired now um, and you've sort of moved into the coaching world uh, yep. Tell us about IDPA and, and why you got involved, why you started it. Yeah, I've always believed in youth. I, 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 it's the only way that I know. And uh, what I did was I, I had gone to Iceland, done all my coaching. I got international players over there that I did, uh, developed. And when I restructured the whole youth system of one club, I went to another club and I dealt with small numbers. I put a boy in the first team at 14 and I thought that it was right to you know, push players and players are very, very talented. And I just felt that one player could play with 10 older players. I always believed that there's enough quality and enough, you know, for a boy to go into a first team and play with 10 players that are very grown up and very can take control and look after the player. And I gave the manager an indication that get rid of loan players, just play young players, play young players, build up your old youth system, build players up, then you can sell players to the, the, the leagues above. And I, I, could, I, sorry, I, could, you, could you do that because the league over there is a little bit more technical? Because I often think that of, of Spain, uh, Holland, Germany to an extent, that actually the, the game over there is far more 
of a technical basis, and that means that you can give young players an opportunity. Whereas when you start going through League Two, League One, even the Championship, physically it is still to this day and age incredibly brutal at times. Yeah, the Ice the Ice Bandit League is technical, but they are physically strong. They are they they want well, the, Vi- to do the Vikings, well. aren't they? Of course, yeah, yeah. They they they, they do prepare well. They want to play. They've got the right attitude and the, the mentality to play. And and I was given the free reins to redevelop the whole youth system. And I just I went around the football pitch one time and I said, with the chairman, and he said, what do I think? And I, and I said, well, I'm looking at your players. And I pointed at a kid and I said, that boy will play in the first team. And he said to me, he laughed at me. He laughed. I said, I'm telling you, you're going to see. And I trained him, trained him with his group. He was developing a lot quicker than the other players were developing. And then the manager put him in the first team. He had spoken to me about him. He trained with him and then he went into the first team. And then I started developing the players and I started giving the first team an influx of players instead of taking on loan players as well. And they fitted into the, into the squad. And I restructured the whole youth system and then I formed that then going towards the first team. And then it built up with relationships with the... Uh, the Icelandic FA, and then I took a training session for the under-14s Icelandic, under-15s Icelandic national team and took the training and built up a relationship and really, really took hold of it. And I was there for four years and it, it was great. But the IPDA, I wanted to come back because my son plays. My fiance has basically said, listen, you need to come back now and they were travelling. We, we, we all get ruled by them, don't worry. The, the other half... <laughs> We, yeah, we, all, we, all, we all like to think we're in charge, don't we? But we're not really. No, no. Well, I'll be honest with that and say probably not. But, you know, on the football inside, I said I'll only come back if I can give back to the community, if I can give something to kids out there that is really going to benefit the community, really benefit that we can combine something with, you know, really giving back and really making it affordable for, for kids and well, so, so not only, well, you've done that and... and more than done that you've, you've come back you know you've set up your academy um, that you've got in, in the Midlands yep. and then and you recently saved a power league uh, facility from closure which again will have saved jobs all that type of thing you know the facilities yep. you know again was that were you compelled to do that just because you wanted to give back or is that now uh, I think your fiance is in, in, involved in business and, and that sort yep. of thing as well was it just actually we can do this together and, and make a real difference to the community Tried to get we've tried to get power league for over a year and a half, and basically we were we were coming to a uh, we were getting there with basically about to take it over, and then obviously they you, you know certain things change from their side with the uh, all the back room and the finance directors change or whatever it was, and all of a sudden we with the academy it it was just moving along with different I was I was travelling to different centres and I first started with three kids. And I, 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 drove, I was driving and getting there and it, it was pouring with rain, three kids. They basically told a friend, told a friend, told a friend, and it just built up from there. And then all of a sudden now, I'm at a point now where we've, we've got a facility which fits in with the community because on my fiancé's side, she's got trampoline parks, uh, an inflatable park, and we've got a yoga studio. So everything that... I'm coming down. I'm moving. Yeah, I'm, I'm telling you, it's, you know, it all fits into in, into place, you know. So what I do now with the academy is they come in and train. We give them a football kit at the centres. We give them a football kit. They come in and train and a bag. And at the end of each course, they can jump at the trampoline park or the inflatable park. You know, I incorporate the yoga into the football as well so the kids can go and do yoga. So everything now is all sort of fitted into place for the community, not just football, but activities for kids as well the special needs in those facilities. But now it leads up to the football side of it as well, where I can have an infrastructure now where the academy is going to be based there. The gra- everything's there for the community. We've saved jobs. You, you know, we're, we're going to do special needs. We're going to do walking football. We're doing disabil- disability football as well. We're doing all things for outside, the mental health side as well that fits into, you know, having opportunities for kids to play football, but with the yoga, all the special needs in the other centres as well. It, and it's, it's all... It sounds like you've almost developed the perfect business plan, if you like. 
and and is that I said probably is is the biggest part of that the facility is is that what we lack in this country to for people to do what you've done it is actually being able and you've obviously worked very very hard to to get that facility yeah but is that the most important thing do you think me being as a footballer I don't miss it at all me coaching and me being able to see people in the area come into a facility knowing that they're going to enjoy it and making sure for everybody, not just football, but everybody outside that they can come somewhere with other activities that we're going to be doing to really give them something to be proud of and knowing that they can find somewhere to go, enjoy themselves, be happy. You know, I'm having a gym there. I'm having a physio there. I'm having a sports psychologist there. We're going to have everything tying in with the mental health side of things there. You know, we're having a sports bar there where people can come and watch the football with Sky Sports, BT, you know, everything that I want to do as well is to give them something that they know they can go somewhere and know that they're in an environment where they can be happy and enjoy what they're doing. I'm, I'm, the football side of it, I don't miss at all. Coaching and, and giving back and really enjoying seeing that people are going to benefit from what we want to do, not just with the football, but with the trampoline parts. We do everything there for them is what it's all about. And I, I really am more happy than I am, I'll be honest with you, than what I was towards the end of my career because I was losing my mum in the last five years of my career. And I lost interest in that. And I wanted to really, you know, I'm, I'm starting to do things with charities now. And I really need to sort of look back of all the things that I've been through and try and give that guidance and, and, information and help people and, and give back to every everybody in the community and try and do everything I can to really make it a better place. I mean, I, I think it's absolutely amazing what you're doing for grassroots football. You can hear the passion um, that you've got for it, the passion for the community, for business, you know, to invigorate, give these kids an opportunity whether they go on to play professionally or not. It doesn't matter. You can, I mean, the, the passion that you've got, I think a lot of people can learn an awful lot from what you're doing so just give out the the website and a few details that if they want to go on and, and have a look on it yeah the, the website is um www.ipda-quasi.co.uk then obviously we've we've with the facility it's just all starting to be up and running as well so that will be at um www.soccerzone.football and then obviously we've got the yoga rooms as well which is www. Uh, yogarooms.co.uk that, that's more, got, with, with my back and knees that's more my thing these days whenever you're in the area you're more than welcome Dan <laughs> anytime and then you know with the trampoline parks as well you know we're all on social media on Instagram and, and everything like that you, you know it's it's you know everything that, that's going on and I'm, for the kids for, for, for the, the grown ups and you know I'm, I'm I'm really enjoying it really looking forward to the future for all of the all of the community and and I'm grateful to everybody because without the parents in the academy and giving me that trust to coach kids, you know none of this would be possible. So I've got to thank everybody for that, and I've got to thank all the people that have really sort of played a part in my career and my life, and and really everything that I'd learned, I'm being able to reverse that now and give back to the to to everybody that's involved. Well, I think what you're doing is is absolutely fantastic, very humbling uh, and very inspirational. Uh, as well but just to move on now you, you've you mentioned briefly earlier uh, you've got a son that plays um, I think yep. he's at the, the Wolves Academy yep I've, I've got a son that I think is slightly older than that but from your yep. point how difficult is it as a parent to manage a kid with talent that is at an academy uh, well his mum takes him <laughs> <laughs> I go I drop him on uh, see it's, it's, it's crazy Dan because now he trains on a Monday night. He'll go all day on day release from Wednesday to Wednesday, 8 o'clock, 8.30 till 5.30. Train Thursday night, train Saturday, play Sunday. I've never known anything like it. And the first thing I say to him is, just go and play. Play. You're a kid. Enjoy your life, play. I don't get involved with them. Uh... On the, on the review front, his mum goes. I let his mum go and speak to him. I'm not really, I don't really interact with him. When I'm there, 
to watch him play. I say hello to everybody, anything like that. But the, all I have to do for my son is when he's in the car, just go and play, mate. Be a kid. Have fun. You know, enjoy your life. You know, everything. You know, you're playing the best game in the world. And remember, you know, just just play. And that's how I've always been. I mean, that, I, I just... that's an amazing piece of advice. I've, I've got a son that's that's 15 in the academy system. And I go and watch him every time, you know, as often as I possibly can in games. And, and yeah. I, I'm, I'm on the sidelines similar. I don't say anything from the sidelines. Keep very, very quiet, you know, yeah. try and sort of stay out of the way as much as possible. But then afterwards, sometimes I, I get in the car and he's like, how did I play? And I'm I'm sort of like, I'm biting my tongue. And I'm like, yeah. I'm like where do you could have worked a bit? And it's like, and, it, and, I, and I find it difficult sometimes because I think I want to be out of offering advice but I don't want to be overcritical. And I think as a yeah. parent that's been there and done it, it is very, it's too easy at times to be overcritical as, as a parent. Yeah. I, he gets in the car and asks me exactly the same thing. And the first thing that I say to him is, no, you've played football all week. You've trained all week. You've played football. What do you want to go and do? Do you want to go cinema? Do you want to go, do you want to, go to the trampoline park? Do you to, what, what do you want to do as a kid? What do you want? Because I'm a firm believer that you're only going to be young once. You've got to be a kid. You've got to, you've got to switch off from playing football. And I don't get that time to be in there to watch to, to watch the training. But I, um, you, you know, I'm very uh, chilled out about it. I don't really, you know, take any really insight into it with his games. They deal with him on all of that front. And and the thing is, he does come into the academy and train with me. But I'm like, well, just be a kid, mate. You're, you're 11 years of age. You've got your life in front of you. Don't worry about anything. Just... Do you think that will change as he as he gets a little bit older and maybe if he develops to what you expect, it starts to get a bit more serious? Do you think then uh, you might change and start to offer him? Because obviously, you might say my lad's now sort of 15. Yeah. It starts to get a little bit more serious. He's there. He's in the academy full-time basis. Yeah. And, you know, and, and he will ask from time to time. He'll say, oh, Dad, you know, watch my game. What did you think? Yeah. And then, and then do, do you think you might shift a little bit to offering a little bit of advice? Um, this is what I say to him until you're getting paid to play football mate enjoy it until well, the, the, get... the, way, the way it's going at 12 years old that might not be too long <laughs> <laughs> well, the, well you know you know Dan, I, I'm a, I, I just believe that until you go full time then they start giving you that sort of you know they start getting you to understand the importance of how serious it starts to get and, and, and nobody knows where kids are going to be at that age. Nobody knows. And I don't know where he's going to be. I don't know where another kid in the academy is going to be. And the first thing that I have to say to him is, listen, you've just got to enjoy what comes your way. You're going into great facilities, but don't take it for granted. Learn. Listen to your coach. The first thing I always say to him is, don't let me be told you're not listening. Don't let me be told that you're not behaving. You, you go in there. And you're in you're in an environment where you're told certain things to help you get better. Other than that, he's in their hands. They've got to make him better. My responsibility is to be a parent, which is to bring him up the right way and educate him and give him a little bit of guidance and understanding. But until he goes full time, and he might not go full time, I just have to say, well, you know, is what it is, son. Just play. I, I think what you've just said there is almost the perfect piece of advice to to young players young coaches and parents as well. Uh, I think that's absolutely spot on and, and you've summed that up pretty perfectly, uh, in my opinion. So just to finish now, flip quickly flip back to your career uh, yep. briefly. Best manager that you played under and why? I mean, when you played under Wilkins, Redknapp, Pulis, Brian Robson, yep. one, one or two legends in there, not necessarily maybe as managers, but certainly as players. Yeah, the, 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 you know. If you can't pick one, don't you know? But you know, I mean, you... it's, it's that that's a hard choice because the, the the managers that I loved and enjoyed playing were were the ones that could put football aside and put you first, and that's why I want to be that coach, that guy that can help people. Forget football. Are you all right as a person? Do you need anything? Are you that? Is there anything out there that I can do that can get the best out of you and make you come into a training ground and enjoy it? And with those sort of managers, Harry Redknapp, Ray Wilkins, Brian Robson, John Hollins, who I had temporary, Ray Harford uh, looking down on us now, you know, those are the sort of managers that 
you want to play for. Yeah, they, it was all about me on an individual basis and how they treated me. And that's how I try to treat the kids. And I can't thank those guys enough because all of that transforms into my academy and transforms into the community and treating people right. If you treat people right in whatever walk of life you're in, they'll want to do anything for you. So they're the sort of managers that uh, I can say I can't pick one out of them because they're all great men. They're not. They're not just coaches or managers. They're great people. Well, thanks, Nigel. Thanks for coming on. I have to say that is there is some incredibly good advice in there for players, coaches, parents. Incredibly well put. Uh, very, very eloquent as well. Hopefully it all goes well. Um, good luck with your lad. Hope that goes well. Good luck with your academy. Hope yep. that goes well. We'll plug it as well. Uh, and hopefully yep. see you in the future. Yeah, thanks very much for having me and everything that you're doing as well. Yeah, it's fantastic. And, you know, I have to say thank you for the time you, you're giving me. So I appreciate it. And good luck with everything because it's it's, it's a great platform for everybody out there to, to enjoy and get experiences from, from ex-players as well. And you're doing a great job. Top man. Thanks, Nigel. Thanks very much to Nigel for joining us for the sixth episode in season two of the Coach Manual podcast. Thanks everyone for listening. You can keep up to date with the Coaching Manual on social media. Follow us on Twitter at Coaching Manual or on Instagram and Facebook at The Coaching Manual. Register for an account now for session planning tools, high quality coaching content and more essential resources for football coaches at thecoachingmanual.com.